Good morning and welcome. Welcome to the International Ocean Film Festival, to our virtual Q&A for both Coco Lee and for Tahiri Honko. Uh, it's a pleasure to have everyone with us today. We truly have a global audience, so we're very excited about that. Um, my name is Anna Blanco and I'm the, the Executive Director of the International Ocean Film Festival. Um, and we are hosting a series of um, Q and A's for our virtual film festival. As most of you know, this is our first time hosting a virtual. Uh, we were supposed to have our film festival back in March, and unfortunately, we had to uh, postpone uh, due to the pandemic. So. Um, one of the silver linings of the situation though is that it's enabled us to have these Q&As uh, with people from all over the world. Um, we are planning to have at least 14 of them um, between now and next Sunday, August 9th, when the films are, when the festival's over. Um, but they will be available for viewing online afterwards. Um, we're finding that a lot of people are logging into the live sessions, but we're also finding that a lot of people are going back and watching them on their own. So the content is magnificent. Um, the guests are fantastic. And uh, we're just excited to be able to have this opportunity live with you guys, but also share it with our audiences around the world. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to um, our host this afternoon, who is um, Gretchen Kaufman. And she is um, an ecologist and has a tremendous amount of um, experience in her own right. And she's also on our screening committee with the International Ocean Film Festival. So we have a group of about 10 jury members who volunteer their time to help, um, to help select the film. So. Um, and just a little bit more about the festival. Um, you know, we've been doing this for 17 years. It's very nice to have a film festival that is strictly about the ocean. Um, it feels like a small niche when you think about film, but it's actually a very big ocean that everybody can uh, draw from. So a lot of the films are about conservation, they're about, um, recreation there are just about a lot of different ways in which people engage with the ocean and as we all know our oceans need our help and so film is a fantastic way to be able to deliver that message our motto is uh, we save our oceans one film at a time so uh, the films from blue ventures and having you all here today is the perfect um, type of film that we're looking for. So um, thank you for all your efforts and what you do and thank you for joining us here today. So um, let me turn it over to Gretchen and um, thank you for joining us and have a wonderful meeting. Thanks Anna. I just, I just, uh... Could go and put the kettle on, I think. Hi, everyone. Hi. Have one you... moment. Yeah. Okay, there we go. We're all in the same room together, so only one computer can talk at a time. Um, so, Welcome, probably good evening. It's morning here, but probably evening um, where you all are at, or maybe middle of the night. Um, but here is the San Francisco Bay behind me, and I welcome you from our very own um, San Francisco Bay. And I'm excited to be with you all today. It's a little bit challenging since we have so many of you, but very exciting to hear from each of you. So I'm gonna try to um, ask at least one question of each of you. Um, and we'll see how that goes, but try to keep it relatively short um, so that we can stay within the, the hour time frame. Um, and as, as Anna, our director, um, said, I'm an ecologist, but I'm also just wanted to mention that I work with local communities, mostly in Southeast Asia, but also around California on community-based restoration. So I was particularly 
excited about um, Tahari Hanko um, after seeing that in the film review committee, but then also um, Coco Lee because we are divers and love the ocean and the connection between the ocean and mangrove ecosystems is, is my research interest. So um, I'm gonna start with the directors and producers of Coco Lee, Paul and Garth, um, by asking you what inspired your work on Coco Lee um, and then how did you meet her and what is the, her significance in the community that she lives in? Paul, would you like to start? Garth, maybe you should take, maybe, <laughs> I think you should, I think, I think the story starts. Um, well, perhaps the easiest place to start is how, how we found, um, how did we meet Kukuli? And it must have been 2014, I was in the village where she lives and um, I came upon her on the beach and she was fixing, a, repairing a wooden sailing pirogue, um, which is quite unusual for a woman to be doing. Usually it's a man's place. Um, so I got chatting to her and um, yeah, that, that initial conversation where I quickly saw that she was an unusual person um, and had a real story to tell in terms of how the environment had changed and her life. Um, you know, she's hardly, I don't think she's ever left Lamboara, the village she comes from, yet in the short span of her lifetime, she's seen these tremendous changes. And she, she inspired us to, to make the film because of her character and the way she could relate um, the changes in the sea and her relationship to it. Paul, do you have anything to add? Um, maybe just some, in terms of uh, what's Kahuli's role in the community. Um, you know, all these fishing villages are, you know, quite a few people. Um, you've got big families, so Kukuli is a part of this big family, uh, quite a few brothers and sisters. <clears throat> she actually has a, a twin sister herself, um, and they all live around the same area, and they're all um, they're supporting each other, and they, they all have their own individual families, and uh, Kukuli uh, is, is a bit, um, <clears throat> I guess, unique in that she, she's kind of the one who they all lean on at times, even though she probably is the one uh, who has it the the most difficult. Um, she, she's supporting herself, she's supporting her children, she's supporting her husband, um, but then she's also supporting her, her mom. Um, and it's just because she's always there and always willing to go out and do new things. Um, and, uh, you know, she's never, never sits in place. Um, so even though maybe her brother, uh, there's, a, there's a scene in the film where she's, uh, <clears throat> working on some fish, uh, some large, rather large parrot fish. Uh, and those are actually uh, caught by her brother. So who, her brother is pulling in a lot of, a lot of fish uh, during the time that we were filming. And uh, yeah, it's Kukuli who's the one who's uh, helping her mother. Um, and uh, so in terms of her significance, you know, she's, she's this person who's kind of a go-to for her family. Um, yet at the same time, a, a bit of an outcast in that, uh, um, she's a bit quirky and um, always on the go. Um, I could probably talk uh, for, forever about Kukuli, but um, maybe I'll leave it at that for now, unless you have some follow-up questions. Thank you so much, both Garth and Paul. That was really interesting insight after um, having rewatched the films this weekend. I think that um, and, and being a female myself, I, I feel a bit as an outcast as a female scientist, and I really connected with her incredible um, hard work and um, respect she gets from the community um, in, a, in a way as a leader. So that leads me into my next questions for, and I'm really sorry if I get anybody's name wrong, um, Batosa, did I say that wrong? And your name is different on the Zoom. So um, I'd love to ask yeah, you. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Welcome. Hi. Um, Thank you. 
Um, I'd like to ask you about how she focuses as a female, you know, leading in from what Paul said about how she focuses as a female fisher, fisherwoman. Um, and she, I've learned from the website and talking to some of you all that um, you run this Mahari network um, and you protect uh, marine ecosystems over there. You don't learn this from the film, but I thought that that was interesting to ask you about. So could you describe that um, and how long it's been in operation um, and what management tools you use? Because community-based work is very different than um, the top-down approach. You're really working from the grassroots, this grassroots initiative. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Gretchen, for your uh, question. So yes, actually, I'm working for uh, the Mihari Network, where uh, Ventures is one of the members. So Mihari is uh, a national movement of uh, small-scale fishers in Madagascar, and uh, it is. Uh, it was created in 2012 to represent the voices of all small scale fishers in Madagascar that are empowered to uh, uh, manage locally managed marine area or uh, LMA. Um, it has been created to represent the voices of the small scale fishers to build their capacity in fisheries management, in leadership, in uh, communication. And it was also it has also been created to uh, allow people to be learning between those small scale fishers and also to uh, to organize events that allow those uh, people to uh, to talk to uh, high level people. Uh, so Mihari is kind of the it is kind of the hub of uh, small scale fishers in Madagascar, if I can say that. Uh, so we, within the locally managed marine area approach, we empower those small scale fishers in uh, uh, the creation of uh, marine reserves or uh, national and local fisheries closures in the development of al alternative livelihoods so they do not uh, rely only on um, fisheries. So it's like uh, uh, aquaculture or um, beekeeping activities. And we also help them to uh, develop uh, management uh, measures and tools like uh, the DINA, which is a bylaw convention in the management of uh, natural resources in Madagascar. And we also empower them in uh, mangrove uh, restoration. Uh, so in general, the Mihai Network is uh, organizing uh, events that allow uh, those peer-to-peer -peer learning between those small-scale fishers, and uh, it includes uh, fishers' uh, forums or exchange visits uh, between them. So that is mostly what we do with the Mihai Network, and the, the members of the network is composed of uh, small-scale fishers. We now have two more than 200 uh, community associations inside Mihari. So it covers uh, the whole Madagascar. The 13 uh, regional coast of the country is managed by locally managed marine areas. And the members also include the NGOs. We now have 25 NGOs inside the network and the uh, Ventures is one of those uh, members. Thank you so much. That's so impressive. I didn't realize it was, it covered all of Madagascar. Um, so it's Madagascar's uh, national approach to management. Um, and I guess one quick follow-up question, have you seen this to be more effective than traditionally uh, managed marine protected areas? You might not know the answer to that question, but um, can you give us a little bit more information on um, how successful your programs have been? Uh, you mean the Mihai Network, right? Yes, the, yes. Uh, Sorry, the Mihai Network, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, actually, yeah, Mihai was created actually in 2012, so we've been here for eight years now. And we, we can say that Mihai is the main uh, partnership of, um, it's like a big uh, stakeholders uh, that is, uh, like we, how to say that, we, we, uh, we are uh, we are the only and the unique platform that represents the voices of the all small scale fishers in Madagascar, which is about uh, 540 people now. Uh, and we we are the unique platform that makes sure that those small scale fishers are represented in decision making at national uh, uh, high level high, high level uh, decision making at the government level, and we also make sure that. Um, their voices are uh, represented in, uh, 
in uh, all uh, yeah in our decision in general so i can say that it uh, it was a great success actually the mihai network we also won uh, uh, an award last year actually in the in that uh, representation of the voices of small scale fishers so i can say that uh, that the mihai network was a big uh, success we have uh, organized um, four national forums so far and where we uh, manage to present to, to our government and also our funders some big uh, requests from the small scale fishers on how we can improve uh, the management of Madagascar's uh, marine resources. And uh, maybe just to, to mention about Kukuli, because uh, as we can see in the movie, she, she's a, an amazing woman. So one of the biggest, one of the biggest events that we were plan, planning to organize this uh, year was um, a program called Fisher Women Leadership Program, where we wanted to uh, promote 25 uh, women uh, around Madagascar in uh, uh, in fisheries management. So it will be like 25 uh, kuli, but around Madagascar in all the regions. So that is one of the like Mihari doesn't focus only on fisheries management, but we are also now working on gender approach because the the role of women in fisheries management is. Uh, underestimated in Madagascar, but actually based on surveys from 2012, actually more than 20% of fishers in Madagascar are women and more than 50% of cleaners are women, which means that women have an important role. So that is why Mihai wanted to organize also um, that gender approach on how to, to promote the role of uh, women in uh, mine conservation. So. So oh, yes, yeah, that is what we some of the success that we uh, that we have done so far, and we also we have also organized more than uh, thirty exchange visits so far, which made uh, where we tried to replicate all the best practices on mangrove restoration, on uh, uh, creation of marine reserves, on the bans of uh, destructive fishing practices, trying to exchange uh, uh, small scale fishers between them so they can learn from from each other. Wow, that's so impressive. I'm really um, excited to hear more about this um, from the filmmakers, but it's, what an incredible um, insight into what's happening on the ground in Madagascar. So you're working, you work there, you're living there in Madagascar, right? Yeah, yeah. neat. Thank you so much for tuning in and sharing um, all your local insights. 20% of the Fisher people are women is very impressive and super important. Um, so thank you for all you're doing for the um, for the Mihari network. And I hope you continue to have successes into the future. Um, I do have a question for all of you at the end about the pandemic and how that has been affecting um, all of your projects. So I'll wait till the end for that. But now, next, I would like to um, invite the editor of Kokoli, uh, Matthew Judge, um, a question. So. Thank you very much, Fatosa. Um, so what does your team hope to achieve with, I'm saying her name wrong, wrong I'm so sorry, Cook Lee. Um, and wh <clears throat> why isn't um, this, um, sorry, why has this been so important for Blue Ventures? We don't, do we have a representative of Blue Ventures on today? Yeah, right, so Matthew, thank you. Uh, quite a few of us actually um, are involved in Blue Ventures. So I think picking up from what Paul and Garth said earlier about how they connected with Kukuli, there's several aspects of the film that are particularly engaging and interesting to uh, like me and other people in, in, my, in my situation. And that is, she is this amazing individual as we see through the film. She's got this amazing um, work ethic and, and personality and her story is super unique as an individual, but she also represents, as we've also talked about women as well, um, women fishers, women fishers in Madagascar. And then one step beyond that, she represents small scale fishers in Madagascar and globally. So for an organization like Blue Ventures, which is an NGO working alongside communities to try and find solutions to various conservation um, problems that we see or the community sees, what better representation of the reality than someone like Kukuli at all these different levels. So our hope for the film and challenge from the, from the film, right through from it being shot through to um, 
me in the editing studio and now trying to think about how to get get this out there is how can we connect with audiences who feel similar to Kakuli. So one of the major um, focuses of our kind of strategy going forward is to do a, a, a host of community screenings of the film uh, in Madagascar and also elsewhere where we can uh, share the film uh, you know, in the local language if needs be, we can translate it into, into other languages uh, and use that film to facilitate discussion uh, and Garth and Paul will be involved in that process um, in the future. We were supposed to do it this year, but um, obviously the world has slightly gone mad. So we're, um, we're on pause for that for now. Um, but we, we've seen the response to the film um, from kind of Western audiences and people in Europe being one of amazement and they connect with her work ethic and they admire her you know, tenacity and ability to get out and do things. And then with small scale fishes, uh, even in China, we had a, a screening in China, we're seeing people connect with, with, with Kukuli's experience and share you know, what they've seen and what the film prompts in them. So in a nutshell, two things we wanna do with the film. Um, we wanna connect with other small scale fishes around the world so we can share experiences and have discussions and hopefully identify solutions or at least be part of the conversation. And we wanna make um, audiences that are far, far disconnected from Kukuli stop and think, uh, you know, what do I need to know about this woman? What do I need to know about the reality for these, these people and explore more? Um, it's not a film that packages solutions, sadly, um, because the solutions are super complex and the causes of the uh, issues that Kukuli faces are also complex. So we want people to, to watch the film and to ask more questions and yeah, reach out to us if you want to know more. We'd love to share. Thank you so much, Matthew. Um, I am inspired by people like Kukuli as well. Um, I work mostly in Southeast, small communities throughout Southeast Asia and Borneo, Indonesia. Um, and I noticed that you are working in Timor-Leste as well in Southeast Asia. So those are prob that's probably one of the places that you're gonna be showing that film. And that's apparently the wild, wild west of uh, Indonesia and Southeast Asia. So, um, uh, and, and now that I'm working in, in Singapore, I would love to, to spread, um, the Kokoli story and, and, and really what I think is so important because it left me thinking, even as a scientist, why are there no octopus left? Because each scenario, each fishing community is a slight, has slightly different problems, but we know that climate change is a big one, of course, um, and overfishing, but who is overfishing is always the question I have. Um, so I think that'll be a really interesting discussion um, where you, wherever you take this film in, in the world. And thank you so much for your conservation work. It's incredibly important. And um, really the first um, film that I've seen on women fisher people. And I think that's, that's really special. Um, and so to, to um, finish, I think on Kokoli and go on to the mangrove project, I wanted to see of Paul and Garth um, and Matthew, if any of you guys have more, um, like more of a story to share about your filmmaking. Um, I heard that you were only supposed to stay for a few weeks and then you stayed for four months. Um, were there any interesting um, experiences that you have to share briefly with us um, and maybe give us some insight into films you are making in the future, maybe um, environmental conservation related films. Thank you. Once we get starting, it starts about talking about Kukuli, you'll never stop. Um, <laughs> I think one thing I wish the movie could have done better was to capture her sense of humor, because she's absolutely hilarious. Um, yeah, despite the hardships she faces um, on a daily basis, she's still incredibly happy and positive surrounded by family and, um, you know, such a fulfilled per person. And I think that's one thing I wish we could have related better in the film. Um, she's diminutive. She must be about five foot. And her husband's about six foot three at least. 
but she still um, is very much the man of the house. So that was quite a, a funny thing to, to witness on a daily basis. I'll let Paul um, fill you in with some more anecdotes. Yeah, I guess, uh, I mean, not to say we didn't know what we were doing when we when we started started off, but we, we kind of just asked Kakuli, what are you doing today? Um, so we went in with a bit of a plan, but <clears throat> you know, when we started talking to Kukuli, we just see that she'd go off in all different directions. And uh, I think the first, uh, the first thing that we shot is one thing in the film where she's uh, gathering some, what kind of looks like sap from a tree, um, which she then later uses to, um, to fix her boat. It's what's melted down to, to basically be the glue or paint uh, for her boat. Um, but yeah, so it's just, she's just doing all these interesting things that I think we didn't really expect. Um, and uh, I mean, for me personally, uh, I think half the time I forgot that Garth was out there filming because I was just having such a good time uh, chatting with her. Um, and both of us have a bit of a hearing problem. So we, we'd uh, get into these deep conversations and then, you know, figure out towards the end of the conversation that neither one of us had, had heard correctly than what the other person had said. Um, but I think it just made, it just brought us a bit closer together. And, uh, um, you know, when we, when we showed her the film, <clears throat> uh, you know, once it was, once it was complete, you know, she, uh, she was asking, you know, when are you guys, when are you guys going to make another film? Um, uh, and her, her family was kind of, uh, egging her on, you know, you, you should go abroad to these film festivals. And I think like Garth said, she's, she's afraid to get on a, um, a motorized vehicle. So she said, She'll, you'll never get me there. But uh, in a way, it's kind of like my face and I've already been abroad by by being seen by all these people all around the world. Um, so whenever you guys want to make a, a second film, uh, I'm ready. So um, she's just a pleasure to work with and, um, you know, as a friend and uh, kind of as family now. So, yeah. I think, um... Oh, wow. Kukuli's story and being told from her perspective without any narration from from outside uh, it was a challenge because we're not you know we're not filmmakers we're not professional film crew we don't have big budgets we're learning as we go and we're you know um, but what we've learned from the process was that's a really effective way of sharing a story like this so our desire going forward would be to try and do more of this um, and we're in a unique position potentially in that we're a organization that works very closely with communities. We have a good relationship. Uh, I think I've described kind of the relationship with Kukuli as being a one of a professional and, and a personal one. So it's this kind of unique space we occupy where we can really get to know people, um, which you couldn't do if you had timelines and, and budgets and you were, you know, paying thousands of dollars per day. Uh, to hire equipment, we can do this in a more organic approach. So we're hoping to do more. It's very much on our mind and radar. Um, and well, Kukuli, it took three or four years to, to bring it all together. So hopefully we'll be quicker next time. But uh, yeah, we'd love to do more um, and tell more stories like this. Just, just to add a quick point um, about that is uh, through through the filming experience, we actually were able to train up a, a few young young people from the village here uh, in filming, and that actually uh, became our approach uh, to community outreach and a lot of the work we do. We've we've got young people out there filming, gathering uh, uh, audio and video, and um, going into what Vatasua was talking about in terms of sharing the voice of small scale fishers. Um, that's a really big part of what we're doing now with this, with, with a local team. And even though this film took us, a, um, you know, four years to really turn around, uh, we're constantly pumping out films for community consumption and to spark discussion. So, um, um, that are really accessible and, uh, it's, it's kind of, you know, through this process of, of doing this film, uh, we've created this whole new way of working, uh, for us as an organization. So, um. So that's a really positive thing as well. Thank you all for your insight, um, really deep insight into the filmmaking process and connecting um, with um, Kukuli. Now I'm saying it right, I hope. Um, she just, 
Um, we can, like you said, we can talk forever about her, but now I think we need to shift to the next film. Um, but with that, um, I, I had a question that just came up um, in my head. So both Paul and Garth, you said that you're amateur filmmakers or, or do you work for Blue Ventures? And then we're gonna go into um, Tahari Honko. And I think Chris Scharf is the producer and director, but he couldn't join us today. Um, and I just wanted, wanted to, oh, you're right there. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> I just didn't see your name. All right. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you for all your amazing film work. Um, I've been involved in quite a few um, documentary films and it is a challenge and it takes four times as long as you ever think it's gonna take. Um, and also I'm really um, impressed by the community-based nature of all of this and how grassroots it is. And I think I completely agree when you're on the ground working with these people, you're not just filming. Um, and as a scientist, I don't just do my science and tell people what to do, but I train them and I explain to them why we're doing what we're doing. And so I really appreciate that, Matthew, Paul and Gar. So thanks for, for um, talking a little bit about that. Um, so let's transition to Harry, to Harry Hunko. Um, which means um, in the local language, right? Doesn't it mean um, conserving mangroves for future generations? Something like that, I don't know. That's what I learned it, from the film. Um, and Chris, great. Um, so I really connected with that title, although it took me a while to figure out how to pronounce it. Um, but I, I work in very remote parts of Laos and I've learned the language over the years and it does take time, but it's really amazing to just even know a few words of the local language um, to share that with the locals and that really helps to connect better with the community. Um, so what I wanna start with Chris um, is just complimenting you on your fantastic filmmaking um, and cinematography of the, of the mangroves using drones time-lapse photography, as well as stunning underwater photography, and then also really doing a, a phenomenal job of connecting with the people um, in a very short, um, concise way. And I, I really appreciated that. So my question is what were your um, greatest challenges and biggest highlights um, of the filming and production process? Well, firstly, big thanks for your uh, compliments, Gretchen. Uh, much appreciated. Um, as you say, you filmed in Laos. I would say that uh, logistics was definitely uh, the hardest part of uh, what we did with the filmmaking. Obviously, filming in the mangroves, you're co coping with a lot of mud, um, tides, and then getting from place to place. I was uh, fortunate that a lot of the people here, Garth was my uh, cameraman on the shoot and Alao and uh, Leo were involved in sort of the production side and getting us from place to place. We went by Zubu cart, uh, by ox cart I should say. Um, we went by small dugout pirogues. Um, it was incredibly hot, uh, plenty of bugs, but uh, as hopefully you see in the, in the film, it all came together in the end. So yeah, it was uh, not easy logistically, but uh, very enjoyable in the end. All right, so all of you are working together now on these projects, which that's, I didn't get that from um, um, from your titles and bios, but um, that's really neat to build that team um, energy when working on these local community-based projects. Um, my next question goes to Lei Lau, and I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. Um, you're from the National Blue Forest, and you're the lead from Madagascar, and you had an amazing appearance in the in the film. So I have a um, question, a couple of questions. Um, and I think we're losing connection with you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, great. So my question is first, tell us about your role in the Blue Carbon Project um, and how you got involved in this um, and how has this um, worked in your community and changed your community? Uh, okay, can you hear me? Because I'm sorry, I do have very, very uh, bad uh, internet connection. 
but uh, I don't know if you can hear me properly or not. We can hear yes, you. Yes, we can hear you. Ah, okay. Uh, uh, my role at, uh, uh, at Blue Venture is uh, I am leading uh, the Blue Forest program uh, at the national across five sites in Madagascar. And uh, for the Tairi Hunku project, I am leading the project activity on the ground. And uh, also, I am liaising with the um, uh, authority at a different level, national, regional, and um, uh, local. Uh, uh, how has we changed uh, to the community? How the Tairi Hunku changed the community? Uh, I see and I have learned when I am implementing the project on the ground that our community felt empowered uh, uh, because uh, we are uh, adopting the participatory approach when implementing the community. So all of the community group were involved on the decision making on the project activity, uh, including the women and marginal, marginalized group who are sometimes uh, not having voice um, in uh, making decision on the natural resource management. And um, uh, community also felt uh, incentivized uh, because um, they, they will get uh, revenue from the carbon credit and uh, they can uh, make a project uh, from the carbon revenue and um, they can send their children to school and um, and community are motivated to do and implement the project activity. Uh, for instance, when we are replanting uh, mangrove, uh, community are doing that activity uh, at voluntary basis because they see uh, and they they see that uh, uh, they feel like the project is uh, their project. Thank you very much. It sounds like an incredible project to get involved in. Um, I'm going to now ask Leah Glass, the technical advisor for Blue Ventures, a couple of technical questions and then maybe we'll come back for some more community based questions. Um, first, Leah, how do coastal restoration projects help mitigate the harmful effects of climate change? Um, and can you tell us a little bit more about how the carbon credits work and how the local community gets paid for these? Yeah, of course, no worries. Uh, thanks for the question, Gretchen. Um, so coastal restoration, particularly mangroves. Um, I think it works in uh, it works in two a uh, kind of at two levels. Uh, there's a local level and there's a global level. Um, starting at the global level, mangroves are one of the most carbon rich uh, ecosystems on Earth. They store a huge amount of carbon dioxide in their sediments. Um, and when these mangroves, if the mangroves get lost, then this carbon dioxide will get emitted back into the atmosphere. Um, and kind of hastening the effects um, and leading to uh, climate breakdown. So coastal restoration and conservation projects can, can at scale can help this, uh, can help climate breakdown and climate change um, at a global level. But they're also mangroves are particularly important at the local level as well. Um, in the face of climate change, uh, rising seas, uh, increasingly extreme storm, um, storm events, mangroves act as a barrier. Um, between the open ocean uh, and villages across the tropics um, and they help to kind of like attenuate or decrease the energy um, of uh, storms and also protect against rising seas. Um, so they really are a kind of a kingpin in the world's fight against uh, climate breakdown. Um, speaking a little bit more, I think your second question was around the, the offsets. Um, it's it's, a, it's an unusual concept, um, but we have found it to be, uh, to be pretty successful. Uh, so by conserving or um, restoring mangroves, uh, communities are effectively having a positive carbon impact. Um, and you can work that impact out um, fairly simply by working out how many tons of carbon dioxide 
the conservation or restoration uh, activities are happening. Uh, and across the world, um, I think we all know as a community, people are getting more and more interested in uh, how they can um, help to counterbalance some of the emissions that result from kind of daily life, whether it's traveling to work, flying for business meetings, um, businesses also um, uh, increasingly interested and also in some ways, in some instances, bound by government legislation uh, to counterbalance the, the carbon dioxide impact um, of their operations. Uh, and projects like Tahiri Hunku, um, who can quantify their carbon impact um, can get funding from these either these individuals um, or um, or companies to, uh, to to balance out the emissions. And I think the one they are an important part um, of the, the global fight against climate breakdown. They're definitely not the solution. Um, you know, Blue Ventures we firmly believe that offsets really are only for those kind of like last emissions that you really that individuals or companies can't uh, decrease simply by simple changes in procedure or, um, or changes in, uh, uh, in um, how people live their lives. Because um, there are some emissions which are currently, with current technology, quite hard to decrease. And that's really where these offsets come in. Thanks for explaining that technically. Um, I also have another follow-up question. Um, is it working successfully? And how do the locals get paid? Um, and have they been paid yet, I guess? And yeah, I'll stop there. It's really, it's a really good question. Um, uh, the short answer is yes, it is working. The project has only just started. Um, it was uh, kind of approved by the standard, uh, which is kind of certifying uh, the offsets. Um, it was approved at the end of last year. Um, so we're still learning both Blue Ventures as an organization um, and also the communities that own the project are very much still in the learning process. Um, but yeah, we've, um, from a credit sales perspective, um, we've seen a, a really high demand um, for, for, the, for the offsets that, um, that the communities are selling, mainly because there aren't that many other blue carbon or ocean related offsets on the market. So that's really positive. Um, so we have, um, so the communities have had their first kind of like annual payment uh, from the from the project. Obviously, COVID in itself is having a little bit of a challenging, uh, posing some challenges to the villages and how they spend that money and really doing everything that they wanted to do with it. Um, but hopefully as the world settles down, um, things things will improve there. Um, but yeah, we are still at, uh, Tahiri Hunku is a 20 year project, uh, which is a long period of time anywhere, particularly a long period of time in Madagascar. So uh, yeah, I think we're, we're at the start of a, a long learning journey, but but excited to be part of it. Well, good luck to you. It's a very exciting way to work with communities. And um, is this your first project? I I was curious if you're doing this anywhere else in the world yet. Um, this is this is the first uh, carbon project that uh, the Blue Ventures has technically supported. Uh, we're now looking at. We've, as I said, we've learned a lot through the process of Tahiri Hunku. And, and as a team, uh, Lalau Garth and the rest of the Blue Ventures team, we're now um, taking those lessons and thinking about how we can um, potentially share the, share the experiences with other organizations and also enable um, the Tahiri Hunku communities to share their experiences, the challenges and opportunities that they've faced uh, with other communities, particularly within Madagascar. Great, Thank, thanks for your insight into that. Um, so let's, my final question, then I wanna open it up for anything you all have to say, and I think the audience, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, is um, I've been thinking a lot about this um, um, from a global perspective and especially community um, perspective um, with all the communities I work with in very remote, remote areas. So. Um, the question is, is the coronavirus pandemic having an effect on livelihoods of communities that you're working with, um, especially in Madagascar, because that's where both the films take place? Um, and if so, I'm assuming it is having an effect because I've heard that throughout the Q&A. Um, can you describe those and specifically and how can we help from abroad, from the San Francisco Bay here and all of our listeners, but also all 
all the people around the world that are having um, wanting to have an effect, a positive impact on um, these communities while um, they're having such a hard time with um, fishing. I, I read on your um, on your website there's a COVID response infographic which was um, really effective and it talks about how you have a community-based fisheries monitoring group and that's monitoring the effects of COVID on the communities. So the, the two parts of the question are how is the pandemic affecting the community and then number two um, what can we do to help? And anyone can take this question. Oh do you want to add do you want to input something from the from the impact side? Yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, on the ground here, um, you know, you're seeing a major drop in prices for fish. So, um, you know, fishermen are having to catch more to be able to make the same amount that they uh, they used to make. So that means having to go out more. Um, and uh, at the same time, you're seeing an increase of price of daily goods, so rice. Um, things that people need to get by, <clears throat> especially in these coastal areas, um, because they're a bit more harder to reach. Um, you know, so the question really is, is, uh, you know, some of these markets like octopus, um, most recently, Octo the, the price of octopus had gone up. Um, octopus and squid had gone up uh, quite considerably and people who used to be pure fishermen were, were moving actually into octopus fishing. Um, so when you look at a, a story like Kukuli, and you ask where did all the octopus go? <clears throat> there were, you know, more and more pressures now coming from from male fishermen, um, who before did not have to fish octopus or did not find it as enticing um, as as fishing. Uh, and so, and that's partly why you're seeing decline. And now with this uh, with COVID. Paul, we can't hear you. Something happened to your volume. Sorry, everyone. Um, Paul? I think we're having a little bit of a technical issue with the volume. Garth or Matthew or, or um, from the community perspective, uh, you guys are on the ground, Vatosa and Lalao. Would you like to say something? I'm sorry, we couldn't hear you, Paul. How is the pandemic affecting the communities and how can we help? Garth, do you have any insight? Yeah, I think Paul summed it up quite well. A lot of the fishing, um, is driven by external markets and those have collapsed. So that key source of income has gone for fishers. And at the same time, the basic staples are not reaching the communities in these remote places or they a lot more expensive when they get there. So we are talking about communities who literally fish to survive on a daily basis. You know, they go out in the morning and what they catch that day is what they feed their family with. So even a small knock um, can push people into uh, deeper poverty. Um, and what we've got to do is try and get them through this um, trough. So what we're trying to do is get in, you know, flexible income, fl flexible amounts of money um, and ways of just edging the communities through until fishing can, well, fish prices and supply chains start to work again. It, it does cut both ways. And in, in some respects, the export driven fisheries, um, you know, there's been a drop, drop in demand so there is the potential for some of those stocks to recover. But as Paul said, for the more We've lost Garth as well. Yeah, I think I can add uh, 
I can also add uh, something about uh, this because actually for the for the Mihai network we we have uh, we have elaborated a survey around Madagascar about, about the impact of the, the coronavirus on uh, small scale fishers. So just to add on what uh, Paul and Carl said, we apart from the decrease of the price of product and the fact that all of the fishmongers and collectors have left the villages, which means that there is no way for the small scale fishers to uh, to sell their product and also they do not have the proper equipment to to stock the product they do not have a fridge and uh, stuff like that so apart from that there is also a very low communication about the coronavirus we've um, noticed that most of them are not really aware of uh, what is happening if there is no ngo working in the area and they do not have the proper uh, health uh, equipments like the gels or soaps or or, uh, or water. So that was uh, the, the impact of that study was really uh, um, worrying about what is happening in small scale fisheries uh, um, communities. So uh, for Mihar itself, we have um, created a steering committee, uh, a COVID steering committee, where we involved uh, about uh, 20 organizations from the government, from the Ministry of Fisheries, Ministry of Population, Ministry of Health, NGOs, representatives of small scale fishers, and also some funders to work together on an um, on action plan and the roadmap on how we can support the small scale fishers. So to answer to your question on how can uh, you support small scale fishers in Madagascar uh, to, uh, uh, to say that. Uh, I would say what we are what we are lacking is especially I would say maybe uh, uh, to get some best practices on how the other countries are um, or uh, or helping their small scale fishers. Uh, for 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 us, our government is helping us a lot. Our Ministry of Fisheries is really involved with that swing committee, and maybe also help us to get uh, funding to. Uh, to support the small scale fishers because we what we what we are doing now with our ministries are to create a kind of uh, small uh, shops where those fishers can buy uh, stuff at the low price lower price but most of the the equipment are, are especially for fishing like fishing gears but what we also need is uh, like food or uh, or they can get access to water and soaps and gels, we, which are really important. So I would say the support would be mostly to capitalize the best practices from other countries and also help to fund the funding uh, to support small scale fishers. Uh, to, uh, yeah, yeah, that is what you're doing. Paul, I don't know so if you want this. Sorry, Gretchen. Okay, I just thank you for your local insight. Um, and then what I wanted to ask Matthew um, was, is Blue Ventures, I'm sure you're thinking about how you can go forward because this pandemic is not gonna end anytime soon, especially in the US um, and the effects will probably be seen for years to come. Are you um, planning anything? Um, ways in which we can um, help with the funding? So, uh, it's a slight aside, but I think it's relevant. Uh, and I was going to see if Paul's microphone was working again to mention this. But um, but Sue mentioned information and maybe some people in Madagascar not being aware of it. And Paul's uh, um, one of Paul's colleagues, Symphorian, uh, has spoken to me before and said a lot of people actually don't believe that it's an issue. Uh, Symphorian is a young, young guy from um, the village where Paul is, and he is a music video creator and a bit of a whiz with a camera, kind of similar to um, the scholars that came out of the Kakuli project. And he has been making music videos about coronavirus that are screened locally and shared locally on social media. Uh, they're kind of catchy songs and they're really great fun, but they've got this level of information in them about what the pandemic is and how to respond to it. So that's one aspect that I'm more interested and involved in and trying to support people like Symphorian to continue to develop locally relevant media from from the field up. So, um, you know, support to help fund those is always greatly appreciated. Um, and I guess as an organization, I'm probably not the best person to answer in a general sense, but yeah, it's changing everything. Um, 
it's changed the way that we work as a, as a team that like we're all working remotely now. Um, and that's ex like many companies has, has accelerated the direction of travel anyway. And um, we're certainly going to be doing less international travel. Um, and we're going to be thinking of and have been thinking of ways to do our work in a remote fashion. Um, and I guess the final word on coronavirus for people in Madagascar and across the world is that it, you know, it's uh, the problems, the way the problems that they have in dealing with the coronavirus are there, were there before and will be there afterwards. And the pandemic has just sort of made them worse to a degree. Um, so yeah, it's a huge challenge ahead. Um, we'll see how things work, work out. Yeah, just to just to build on that, just to just to end, I think that you know that that is a really important point. I think many of the challenges that the people like Kukuli, uh, the communities in Tahiri Hunku, uh, they're facing um, are largely because they've got you know it's it's they don't have very high resilience to stop uh, to shocks, as Garth was saying. Um, and I think you know as a as a global community, people in San Francisco or here in the UK, um, what you know what can what can we do about that? I think there's 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 two two main things. Um, one being uh, supporting sustainable seafood chains. Uh, so you know fisheries are collapsing, which do make people you know very vulnerable to to uh, to shocks like the coronavirus um, and also to other economic so shocks. So by supporting uh, seafood suppliers and seafood chains that. Um, that really factor in the value uh, and the importance of small scale fishes, I think is critical. Uh, and also climate change is the beast that is following uh, coronavirus. And I think that's fairly uh, well recognized internationally. Um, and you know, communities uh, like those that Kukuli um, and Titahiri Hunku uh, are based in, their impacts on climate changes is minimal, um, but they are gonna be the, the communities that feel some of the greatest effects. So as a globe, thinking about the impact that, uh, that our daily actions have on climate change, I think will really help communities um, in the Southwest of Madagascar and more broadly across the tropics be more resilient to future shocks like coronavirus. Thank you so much for your insights, Leah and everyone else. I, have, I wanna end on one last community question. We had two questions um, and I think you've already um, answered parts of both of these questions, but I just want to acknowledge our audience and the questions that they gave us. And maybe this is, I think this is a good wrap up question. Um, so there are two questions that are fairly similar. One was by um, Tina Martin. How has the success of Kakuli impacted the other women um, fishers um, and their management in Madagascar? And secondly, Andrew Howard, said, how do you think that these films will impact advocacy efforts for human rights um, based marine conservation on a global scale? And I know you've already touched on both of these, but maybe Matthew or, or someone else that has a nice way to wrap this up. Um, these are two questions from our audience and thanks, thanks to our audience for watching and I hope you enjoy the films. Paul, are you, are you there? Because I think that first question's got your name on it. Um, yeah, in terms of the first question, I can maybe respond to that. Uh, so yeah, I mean, in terms of uh, what people see when they see Kukuli, um, you know, even though people know who she is, uh, you know, in her community or in her village, when you know, when they see the film, um, they're surprised to see her do those things, uh, you know, whether it's uh, on the boat or, you know, building her house. Um, you know, there's this shock that, hey, wow, look what she's doing. She's doing everything. And um, actually, one of the things that struck Garth and I the most uh, when we went to to her village the first time was um, uh, the fact that these there were all these women there who who didn't have husbands um, yet were mothers um, and and making lives for, those, for themselves. Um, and it was all on these alternative livelihoods of seaweed farming. Um, that you also see a little bit in the film there. Um, whereas in other communities where they don't have that, uh, a, a woman has to rely oftentimes on a, on a fisherman so that they can, they can have uh, enough income to be able to support their family. Um, but here you're, you're seeing women empowered to be able to uh, 
do it all on their own. Um, and uh, as, as one of the women said, you know, why, why would anyone need a husband if you could uh, make this much money on your own? So um, I think and seeing Kukuli is just another inspiration and motivation to, uh, to women around here to be able to um, make it on their own. Thank you, Paul. Anything the, the second question by Andrew Howard was, how do you think these films will impact advocacy efforts um, in human rights, space marine conservation worldwide? It's a good question. That's a tough one. Um, the, the film doesn't try to identify explicitly the causes or the solutions to the kind of context uh, that Kukuli faces. Um, and as I kind of mentioned earlier, our desire for the film is to allow her to speak um, in her own words. And so if there's power in that, then hopefully it will have an impact. And the, the, the response we've seen, and my, my first response, even though I'm very familiar with the film, when I watch it is kind of a, wow, what, what next? Um, her life is w walked on this tightrope and, you know, she seems one minute so close to success and one minute so close to failure. And that is the reality for, for her. And that's the reality for many people in Southwest Madagascar and elsewhere. So I don't know, in terms of global advocacy, it's a really tough question. And I don't really have a, a, an answer for that in terms of how successful it might be, but hopefully it makes people stop and think. Um, and I think that's what the film can do uh, for global audiences and also for um, people that are really familiar with it, the, the story. Um, yeah, it's a good, really good question. I don't know, Garth, if you want to add anything to wrap. You're on mute. Yeah, we set out to show just to what degree um, climate change, global markets, population growth are impacting on small scale fishes. And, um, you know, Kukuli is one of 100 million people who survive from small scale fishing in the tropics. So, you know, if we can put across what it's like for just one person and, um, the changes that we as a, a global population are exacting on those remote people um, and start a conversation around that. I think that's a step towards reinforcing small scale fishers rights and um, you know, building a case for human based fisheries management. I hope that answers your question. Thank you so much, both of you, um, for answering those tough questions. But I think it's a really important way to wrap up um, the Q&A here on a global perspective. So um, thank you all filmmakers, producers, editors, um, directors, technical staff, and community partners. This was such a neat uh, Q&A to be involved in. Um, really connecting with all of you on the ground in Madagascar, as well as um, in the home office in, in the UK. Matthew, thank you. Um, any last comments? I think we need to wrap it up though. It's um, a little after 11. No, just thank you. Thank you very much. It was great to, great to chat. Nice meeting you all. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. All right, yeah, and likewise. if you guys, yeah, great to meet y'all. If you can hang on just a moment after um, the 